Welcome back to our Succession podcast. This week we are talking about Season 3, Episode 6, What It Takes. It's very exciting. I mean, I was really looking forward to the shareholder vote, but it's also very exciting how they're setting up, you know, what we're going to see from here, all new characters and storylines. One of the first things that happened in this episode, one of my conspiracy theories kind of came to fruition, which is that I didn't think that Kendall had any useful papers And that was proven in this episode. Lisa said the papers were not as explosive as she was led to believe. And part of my theory was that I thought that Kendall knew that and was going forward with it regardless. And it wasn't clear from this scene to me whether or not he knew that and was just being like, oh, really? Are you sure, though? The vibe I got from the scene was that Kendall doesn't actually know anything and didn't know what he was doing at all. It seemed like he thought maybe the papers had value, but didn't actually know how to confirm this, and that's why he was being cagey about it. Or he thought he could get something more useful from the raid, and it was a gamble he took, but it didn't actually turn up anything. And at the point that Waystar is cooperating to this degree... Um, it's kind of counterproductive because they're just dumping loads of papers on them, which is something that a lot of, you know, both corporations and like the governments <laughs> do in investigations like this is just drown them in papers so they don't actually find anything that useful. So it looks like a thorough investigation, but uh, they're, they're obviously might still be withholding some things or were careful with their record keeping to begin with is kind of what was implied by this scene. And the wedding has been confirmed. It is Caroline, who is marrying someone who we don't know, not her previous boyfriend, Rory. Someone new. This was a fun confirmation because we knew that there was a wedding coming at the end of the season in Italy. That was confirmed from some like behind the scenes pictures that came out over the summer, but we didn't know whose wedding it was going to be. So there was a lot there was a lot of speculation leading up to this season of who might be tying the knot. I was hoping Tom and Shiv would get divorced and get married again, personally. <laughs> that would have been so funny and sitcom it, it it succession is a sitcom. Exactly. Um I think Will and Connor were the most popular theory, personally. I was this was before the season came out, so I thought maybe Roman would meet someone who would finally say yes to him since Caroline we knew Caroline was coming and it never occurred to me Caroline is also unmarried and hot it could be her wedding right I love this it totally makes sense and I would say this did become a theory among fans a couple weeks ago when uh, the summary for this episode was released and it said that Roman found out surprising news about his mother and someone went, oh, it's Caroline's wedding. And it it kind of immediately made sense because of what Jesse said in an interview over the summer in in Vulture. Yes, he said uh, Tuscany has this particular flavor for the English upper class. Some call it Chianti Shire in a slightly sickening way. I thought of this quote immediately when the Caroline theory started. In hindsight, it was very obvious this was going to be Caroline's wedding. Yes, it totally makes sense that this would be her choice. And obviously, there hasn't been a lot of lead up for anyone else to get married this season. So it makes sense. It's a more um, minor character, but that she would bring a lot of the family together to this event. I loved how Roman, Shiv, and Kendall were equally left out of the wedding announcement. Um, Yet they immediately took their hurt feelings and went to call Kendall and bully him about how he was left out. Just classic sibling behavior. Yeah, I don't think any of them have a very good relationship with mommy. So it was kind of rich for them to bully Kendall about that. They all have both daddy issues and mommy issues. Exactly. That's why they're so interesting. Let's do best line. Words are just, uh, what? Nothing complicated airflow. My favorite line of the episode was, having been around a bit, my hunch is that you're going to get fucked because I've seen you get fucked a lot and I've never seen Logan get fucked once. This was the type of line that can only happen three seasons into a show and there was so much weight behind it. I just loved it. This this in a lot of ways is, is like one of the top moments of the season so far for me. Tom has really been a quiet observer for much of the Roy family shit show. So it was great to see what he thinks of everything. And he's been paying attention. He knows how things work and he can't be so easily manipulated. So I really enjoyed 
this line. I also enjoyed this line so much that I also picked it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I suspected this would, would happen. This it was just the best line. <laughs> it was the best line. One of the best scenes of the show, I would say. Kind of going off what you're saying about him being the outsider, like, I feel like near the beginning of the show in particular, there was a lot of discourse about Greg being the most relatable character and the audience surrogate, which may have been true at a time, but I feel like it's definitely, at this point, Tom is the most relatable character, I would say, and most clear-eyed about the Roy family. That's true. I think that, especially in this episode, Greg has really shown his transformation into being a Roy. Like, you know what he says in early season one where he says he's a Roy in all but his name? It's he really is. true. He was like, proving he that. So. Like, he, his, his transformation really took a big, I think, leap and bound forward this episode. So now it seems like Tom, who at the beginning was sort of cruel to him in a certain way, but also kind of trying to be his friend. But that, that dynamic has almost kind of flip-flopped now. Yeah, completely. And it's putting Tom in the line of fire, but he was able to deliver this just absolutely devastating read on Kendall. Yes. And I love that for him, especially in a season where he's had so many losses and is often, the, or always, has been the least powerful person in the room. It was great for him to get this kind of victorious moment. And I think what made it more, more devastating is that Tom didn't really even intend it to be that way. Oh, no. <laughs> like he was the just way, facts. The way he <laughs> phrased it. Uh, he's like, I'm just pointing out some things that I have noticed, and Kendall really needs a reality check like that, so I'm glad that he was the one to deliver it. The scene between Tom and Shiv, we sort of have this slow burn built up of their relationship just kind of getting worse and worse each time we see them alone. So Tom, once again, is complaining about his impending imprisonment, and Shiv, once again, does not know what to say to him and isn't really all that interested in, in providing any you know, comfort or reassurance. No, she says, I don't know what else there is to say, but I don't get the impression that Shiv has actually said anything of substance on the topic of Tom going to prison. Like It seems like each time it's come up, she's just been like, well, I don't know what to say about that probably won't happen, just don't think about it. Which is very typical for the Roy family, they don't really know how to talk about uncomfortable subjects, and I think none of them have really had to confront um, a reality like this before. I think the question with Tom at this point is, we did see him make that call to a lawyer a couple episodes ago. We don't know what it was. We don't know, was he trying to make another deal? Was he, does he have something up his sleeve as far as with the cruises, you know, situation. And I would say from this episode, it does, it really does not seem like it. I don't think they do twists like that. But what if he was calling a divorce lawyer? (laughs) Have we thought about that? That's also an option. (laughs) And I feel like that wouldn't um, change the things we've seen. Like, it's not as hard to explain his actions if that was the call, maybe just an exploratory. What would it look like with this prenup to get out of this? Oh my god, I'm processing this. Mm -hmm. I I mean, you know, I'm against the theory that he's like an informant or something, because he just seems so sincerely depressed at this point and convinced he's going to jail. I agree, and I wouldn't like that twist because I feel like it would remove a lot of the emotional scenes that we're seeing right now, just would not hit as hard at all and I don't like twists that like remove emotional stakes so I hope that he's not like already an informant I think that would be stupid yeah (laughs) I don't think he's that good of an actor either like he's like nearly crying in all these scenes he's he's nearly crying and he's not asking anyone for information he's turning down opportunities for information and to get closer to people yeah he would be doing a really bad job at being an informant if that was what he's actually doing here so I don't think that's the case I would buy divorce attorney over that, though I also, I don't know, I have trouble seeing him ever actually leaving her, but I like that dream. Yeah, it is, it is hard to see because he was, he has been trying to pressure her into having a child, which doesn't seem like the move if you're considering divorce. Oh, that's true. But it, that, it still makes more sense to me than that he's 
trying to flip on Waystar or something. Maybe it's something he's considering, but he's not moving forward with a divorce yet, necessarily. Yes, that's kind of my my thought, is that it was just sort of uh, feeling out his options there. <laughs> And as, as he says to Shiv and sort of a devastating line is that there's, you know, there's not really any point to, to having sex with you if you're not going to get pregnant, which is just <laughs> kind of, um, face mm, from that. <laughs> that's quite the thing to say to your wife. <laughs> but I got to say, it's interesting that he is now sort of using sex in sort of a controlling way because Shiv has done that to him so much with the open relationship and you know basically having a one-sided open relationship where she's allowed to do whatever she wants and he, and he isn't for him to now kind of <laughs> flip the script and be like we're not having sex is kind of interesting I don't I don't mind it <laughs> yeah he was withholding on saying I love you and then he let that go and now he's withholding on sex we get a brief check-in with Connor and Willa. We haven't seen a whole lot of Willa in this season. I loved her dress, first of all. That's an important thing to comment on. But it is kind of sad that Willa, who is a former call girl, is now um, being used by Connor to charm old men at this at this conservative political rally to kind of advance his career. It's absolutely awful. And I don't understand how she's even going to fit into his campaign if he continues to pursue it. Like, Connor, is he just going to be unmarried and have this former call girl girlfriend who's also, like, seducing people into voting for him? And also, he was very seriously undermining her career in this episode. Uh, she mentions that she realized she's not really interested in being a commercial playwright, and he goes, well, the audience kind of helped you realize that, didn't they, honey? Which just... Yeah. At least she was writing her play at this, you know, event. I I love that for her. Yeah, and it seems like she's not as uh, supportive of the campaign as she has been previously. I mean, in season two, she was, like, writing his speeches and saying he looked cute in his video, and now it's, um, she's not quite as into it, so... Maybe some trouble brewing for them as well. Everyone's breaking up this season. So there's a Steven Root cameo in this scene. And to me, the scene, I thought, did a very good job of capturing, like, Me Too culture. How guys are still saying just absolutely disgusting shit, same stuff they were saying before. But now they also say, oh, but I'm going to get canceled for that. Yeah, now they just can make a joke about it. And then you have to go, (laughs) oh, ha ha, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not one of those, though. I'm a cool girl. Yeah, I love that they gave this scene to Willa, since it felt like the most serious scene we had gotten from her so far. It's time for Let Them Eat Cake. Let us eat cake. (laughs) So my Let Them Eat Cake moment was Tom and Greg training themselves for prison by eating diner food. Yeah. Which this diner looked super cute to me. I love that they have to like force themselves to eat this to like get used to how bad this food is. Yeah, just like training your palate. <laughs> yep, and it felt like great contrast to in season one when Tom uh, took Greg out to eat at a nice fancy restaurant. Oh, true. That is a great. That is a great contrast. <laughs> he taught him how to live rich, and now he's teaching him how to live in prison. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That that was a great moment. My let them eat cake moment was Tom's wine from their vineyard. He said it was their vineyard. So maybe they own a vineyard and they're just like sent, you know, this is our this is our batch of wine. I, I love that as soon as he unwrapped it, he said, oh, screw top, the way his face fell when he realized that. And then, of course, trying to rationalize that the wine is, you know, challenging or earthy or that you have to meet it halfway. And there's a lot to unpack. It's actually just bad. It's just bad wine. It's not very good. That was a great scene. And I I love scenes, too, where the characters are having, like, two different conversations. So Tom is talking about the wine and Shiv's talking about, you know, the politics. And they're just (laughs) talking to themselves. So that was just a very fun scene. Tom and Shiv are always having two different conversations, is what I would say. So when Shiv had fallen asleep and Tom texted Greg, his, like, late night you up text to Greg next to his sleeping wife. That was so funny. I actually screamed a little bit when that happened. (laughs) That was amazing. Just the pan from Shiv asleep in bed over to Tom texting Greg. It's a scene that I know has been done in like 
various movies and shows as like an affair is happening yeah mm-hmm. it was totally like this person is cheating <laughs> you you don't text someone like you up in the middle of the night unless it's a hookup but i mean i guess tom is middle-aged so it can be forgiven that he didn't know this rule they're having sort of an emotional affair and greg in sort of his most roy like move so far brought up the christmas tree nickname and said it's it's not a very nice name but also would you mind, if you're kind of going anyway, can I just um, put my shit on onto you? It was so awful, but it did make me respect Greg a little more than I have in like all the other episodes this season so far, just because it was actually like a smart move on his part. Tom is the one person here who would go to bat for him. I understand that. I wouldn't say it made me respect him. I, <laughs> I would say That's the fair. opposite of that. It was just so <laughs> slimy. And I think the way that he phrased it seemed kind of particularly cowardly to me, I guess, where he was like, it's not very nice, but would you mind? (laughs) It felt cowardly and emotionally manipulative the way he was talking to Tom in that scene, for sure. Which is, um, again, very Roy. Roy all over. (laughs) Roy and everything but his name. And I mean, looking back, it's not like it's that unfair to Tom because Tom was the one that purposefully roped Greg in knowing that he could be an expendable person if it came to this. So in that sense, it's like, well, you kind of like made your bed, Tom. And it's not totally fair that the person that you brought into this should have to like basically against his will, like, you know, look at the death pit and I'm going to make you, you know, take the fall for this. Basically, it's not totally fair to expect that of Greg, but I just still really felt bad for Tom here. There's something about Tom. He just has so much pathos that I just can't help (laughs) but feel bad for him, even when like objectively he kind of deserves it. (laughs) That's a good point, though, that this is really on Tom and pretty much all the people who are are being blamed for cruises, it is someone else who dragged them into it. I think Tom called it a virus when he was first telling Greg about it. It definitely is, but Tom is the only person to actually take responsibility, I would say, and say, okay, I did probe you into this, so I'll, you know, help you as much as I can. That's true. And that's probably why I just ended up feeling bad for him is because he just accepted it. So Kendall has an interview or, you know, a deposition or something with a DOJ. And it seems like it did not go very well. No, we only saw the very end where Kendall denied there being any other illegal contact that he was involved in. In a very unconvincing way. Like, not that I can recall right now. No. I'm still holding out hope for some payoff to all the the vague mentions of manslaughter this season. That is like the thing that is hanging over Kendall's arc, obviously. So the other shoe has to drop at some point. It'll just be interesting to see how they actually do it. When they were leaving the room and Kendall began to go on his rant, at first it seemed like Lisa thought, you know, Kendall just has no self-control. But when she realized that that was a purposeful move, that's when it really clicked for her. And she was like, God, this guy really sucks and doesn't know what he's doing. That was a really stupid move. And she then completely tore into him, which is what kind of ended their professional relationship is that she very accurately laid out everything he did wrong and he did not want to hear that I don't think honestly it wasn't even that bad of a roast I felt like it was very fact-based I mean those are the worst roasts for Kendall like to be honest like when somebody just tells him objectively like what's happening in reality he's like no (laughs) he'd rather have a you know YouTube video that's just making fun of him than actually pointing out his flaws well let's do location 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 Venice, St. Bart's, the Maldives. Has she heard of these locations? She must be aware of them. I became kind of obsessed with uh, the diner location and I went back. I, I I had been thinking of it as like a Denny's. That's just like what my brain kind of auto filled in. But I went back and the sign said uh, Dee Dee's Diner, which I Googled and I found the location, which is in New York State. And it's not a chain. There's only the one, only the one location. And it was really fun to see these characters just completely out of their element in a normal diner. It's not something we see very often. And I could watch Kendall scan the menu in horror for hours. It was just great (laughs) entertainment. (laughs) It was great stuff. Just this little family diner that Tom is having his rendezvous with various men in it. 
Yeah, and the fact that it wasn't a chain, now I was like, they probably had good food. Like, you know, when you go to like yeah. a family owned, like local diner, that's a great experience. <laughs> if, it, if, it, if it was a Denny's, I would have been a little more forgiving of the like, this is prison food <laughs> statement. But even Denny's, it's like, it's fine. Don't be a <laughs> pussy, Tom. <laughs> You're from Minnesota, grow up. So I looked into the other location for this episode. For the conference, I'm just going to call it a conference of this episode, they filmed at the Jefferson Hotel in Richmond, Virginia. However, the majority of the interior scenes were filmed at the Plaza Hotel in New York. Okay. So pretty much all this episode was actually filmed in New York, which is fair then since it's, you know, much less expensive. Yeah, that's what I began to suspect when I found out the thing about the diner that I was in New York. And that made sense because, like, Jeremy Strong, that was his only scene. They're not going to ship him out to Virginia. No, they, they made him go to Westchester. That's bad enough. <laughs> and I do love this as the in-universe location for this conference. Um, this hotel has been around since the late 1800s. It's named after Thomas Jefferson, and several former U.S. presidents have stayed there over the years. Good tidbit. Thank you. So, uh... Jared Men- Menken is the sort of largest new character that comes out of this episode. And one of his first major scenes is he's talking with some of the other candidates and Shiv butts into it on the periphery and they sort of have a back and forth exchange. And there was something about their their like argumentative styles that I think like both of them were just making terrible arguments, but the way they kind of bounced off each other felt like every single like online argument I've ever read, <laughs> where like they're not really responding to what each other are saying, and it's all just kind of this like really you know tense emotion. This scene was very tense to watch. I can imagine being in a room full of people who I'm expecting to vote for me and having to fire back you know succession style insults that fast. I really noticed this in like this episode, but looking back, it's been a, like it's been a pattern. But the way that Sarah Snook portrays like anger with Shiv, she will laugh a lot. And I think especially like in or maybe even only in like a public place like this, where she sort of has to um, act like she's unbothered by it. So she'll kind of laugh as she's insulting people in a way that just feels really real. Um, like she has to kind of show that she's unshaken by it and not like taking it that seriously. But like you can just get all of this like tension out of the way that she sounds. And it's like, ooh, that's I don't know. There was something about the way that she acted in this scene that really I, I really loved. I, I felt it was very it's a very relatable response to being insulted like this, especially as a woman. Yeah, I felt. Yeah, I think there yeah. is like a gender component to it where you can see when she's arguing with men, either in her family or other you know, other men, she's like, I can't look overly emotional, but it doesn't even really work because her response is, you can tell that she is still like, just very angry. In this scene, Mencken says Etienne is dead, which I found very interesting as a power move since obviously the Raisin ended up deciding not to run for re-election because of Etienne. And in addition, they're all here trying to curry favor with the Roys so they can get decent ATN airtime and, you know, make the primaries. Yeah, I guess, like, Mencken is trying to project that he doesn't care about that. Yeah, it's a bold statement to make, though everything he does in private in this episode just completely contradicts that. Let's do number one boy. You're my boy. You're my number one boy. My number one boy for this episode was Tom. Going into the season, I would not have predicted that I would be picking Tom as my number one boy twice. Though, as is, I've been tempted to pick him more times than that, honestly. There is nothing left for him at this point. While everyone else can still kind of flit between Team Logan and Team Kendall, for Tom, he is fucked either way, and he's fucked because he fell in love and he trusted that he would get some modicum of protection just by proximity to the Roy family, and he's not getting that. But even so, he's standing by his choices, standing by Shiv's side, which I really respect. The thing I really loved about him the most in this episode was that he just handled everything with a lot of dignity. He was still the character speaking most rationally and came out of it looking like the best of a lot, and I'm proud of him. That is a great description. So my number one boy was also Tom. It's the first character that I've picked twice in this season for... For number one boy, which also I would not have anticipated, but 
Um, it was really his his episode. I have been thinking about Tom for like 48 straight hours following this episode. I have not loved Tom this much since like since the beach scene at the end of season two. Like this was a very big episode for him. He was very funny, very sad. Like Matthew McFadden better win an Emmy this year or I will fight. And we got to see some new sides of him as well that we haven't seen before. Like in a scene with Kendall, we have not seen the two of them interact very much. I just loved the way that they played off each other. And as you sort of alluded to, in an episode where many of the Roys were at their most despicable, we got to see the ways in which Tom is still an outsider and still really has some sort of moral sense about him, even though he like runs the equivalent of Fox News. It's fine. We don't need to worry about it. He's a good person, though. It's sad. <laughs> He's a good person. So the Roys have a conference in Logan's room to debate who they want to back for this. And this was a great scene for Shiv. She really argued that they have a responsibility to the American Republic to prevent Mencken from getting a larger platform. And Roman just started mocking her for saying that. <laughs> Um, so she's, I mean, she's the only one in the room saying let's not support the fascist for, I think, what are genuinely moral reasons and not business reasons. Obviously, she got that offer from Salgado, so it's complicated a little bit. But I, I really think just the way that she played this scene, I mean, the bar is on the floor, to be clear. Saying let's not support a fascist is like not, um, not, a, not a pedestal I'm going to put someone on. But I think she really has you know, something of a larger moral sense to, you know, society (laughs) that Roman, I think, completely lacks. Honestly, I'm not even sure how serious that offer from Salgado was or felt for her. Shiv's politics often feel very performative, and Roman says in the scene mocking her, I'm a good girl, I pretend to care about people because no one cares about me, which I get where he's coming from. Shiv has been an outsider in the family from birth, and she definitely has the attitude of, okay, you don't want me in your club? Well, your club sucks anyway. I'm going to go against it. I don't even want to be in it, while also secretly wanting to be in it. But that being said, here, I definitely felt like she was genuinely concerned, which was just really nice to see in an episode with a bunch of, I mean, neo-Nazis, I would say. Yeah, and I mean... There are shades to it. She has thrown away a lot of her apparently firmly held convictions to go and work for Waystar. So it's not like she's, um, you know, always been consistent. But I I will, you know, stand by my interpretation of the scene, which is that I think she had, you know, genuine concern in this moment. And I think that was really sad and kind of scary to watch. Yeah, no one shared that concern at all. Yeah. Because, I mean, it'll never affect them. Yes, I and I think like Roman made that point. He said, "You'll be fine. You have a, you have a trophy husband and several fur coats or whatever. You'll be fine." But that actually did not really seem to be Shiv's concern. Like she was actually concerned about what this would do to the country as a whole, which again, low bar. But she's the only one in the room that's clearing it. So still, <laughs> so President Connor Roy gets. <laughs> seriously semi-seriously floated Uh, for really the first time in the family (laughs) i don't feel like logan was seriously considering this at all honestly i don't think so either it it felt kind of like a pawn or like a thought experiment for him where he was like okay if you don't like my ideas what about connor yeah i don't feel like logan likes the idea of handing any of his kids the presidency Uh, He doesn't want to hand them any sort of power, and especially not someone who's standing in front of him coughing to try to get his daddy to just tell him, okay, kid, we'll make you president, we'll take the photo, we'll put you on ATN. He doesn't respect that. It was like the happiest Connor has ever been, because he was like, I'm getting my moment. Hope he enjoyed it, since I don't anticipate this coming up again. Don't think so. (laughs) It's time for Burn of the Week. (laughs) <laughs> That's not a good retort. Don't fucking laugh at that. So my burn of the week, Shiv said, Roman, you just love the boot because you love to be kicked by it. This is one of my runner-ups. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> this is kind of similar to her burn about his uh, sexual proclivities in the second episode of the season. So we have to wonder how Shiv knows these things, but she certainly knows how to kick Roman where it hurts, but it's too bad he's 
just kind of into that. This line feels like the kind of thing that would keep him up at night, honestly, even though it's a throwaway line, because I'm sure he's wondered how much of his background of abuse at the hands of authority figures has shaped his sexual preferences for, you know, submission and degradation. And that is an unpleasant thing to have to disentangle. Somebody should get him a therapist. There's clearly something more I feel that has happened to Roman that we don't know about. I think so too. Until then, she's just going to bully him about it. (laughs) There's a lot of subtext there about some possible sexual abuse in his his background. Because he's... He's, like, made a lot of jokes about it, and Roman is the type to joke about things that are actually true. Yeah, Roman doesn't actually lie much on the show. He joked about Jerry letting him jerk off in her bathroom the other night, Mm -hmm. which we saw on screen. Yeah, so, yeah, you you have to wonder, like, there's, there is something. I'm sure we'll never know for sure, but, uh, yeah. (laughs) Yikes. (laughs) Yikes. What was your burn of the week? So, mine was... No disrespect, Logan Roy was an icon, but he's no longer relevant. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. It was a great cut. I loved the shift um, to bringing Logan into focus in that shot, um, just sitting a couple tables away. This was a deep cut, and I feel like it's definitely true at this point. I mean, Logan had no involvement in getting the settlement with the shareholder meet. In this episode, Roman is responsible for bringing Mankin over to their side and kind of helping them pick someone. I would say that Logan is in his season two Kendall era. As Stewie said in Walter, Kendall Roy is no longer relevant. Exactly. (laughs) This was an off-screen burn, but I liked when Greg came back to the group and said, some guy with an undercut just called me soy boy. Because I have (laughs) to wonder what the circumstances were. Like, what did he do or say that... (laughs) prompted somebody to call him a soy boy was it just like his general appearance i have a lot of questions but that was also a a favorite line (laughs) so the best scene of the episode i think and one of the best of the series i would say one of the best of the series like literally i'm obsessed with the scene was the tom and kendall diner scene it's so good incredible we we really built up to this in this season with the earlier scene between Tom and Kendall. So I was just thrilled to see some payoff on that because we had talked about before, like I kind of wanted Tom to jump ship and join Kendall. But this scene made it clear why he's, I mean, he was, I think, considering it, but it also made it clear why it wasn't a viable choice for him. So this was definitely like a necessary scene for that. It really broke my heart that Tom immediately ordered food when they sat down, which to me indicated you know, since it's whole, his whole prep for prison, that he wasn't really considering making a deal with Kendall here. Oh, yeah. Like, I think he maybe had a distant thought of, well, let me at least hear the kid out since he flew all the way here from New York. As he said earlier in this episode, he is giving up on hope. He really held his ground and, you know, pushed back on a lot of things that Kendall said and wasn't really willing, I think, to show to Kendall just how much he had sort of given up on hope though like he had he had a little more dignity than he had with greg i would say yeah he held his own really well here and i would say with both Shiv and greg lately tom has been very vulnerable and kind of pathetic so this was great to see particularly this was him being in the room with the enemy and he didn't give anything away and it's clear that kendall is here for self-serving purposes now that he doesn't have a case he needs you know someone like tom to be on his side and you know kendall was really making himself sound more like put together than he actually is like he said i have great new lawyers and i have a solid case but there are some gaps honestly i was surprised that kendall admitted to there being gaps at all but obviously the fact that kendall is coming to tom like tom is not an idiot and must know just from that alone how bad it is so when they move outside Uh, Tom does ask Kendall, how is it better if he were to go over to Kendall's side? And Kendall's response is just very deluded. Um, He says, you know, Shiv would respect him and maybe come over to their side, which I don't buy at all. I think Shiv would be crushed and this would not sway her. Right. I mean, we know how how angry Shiv has been with Kendall. I, I guess I'm not sure how much of that Tom knows, it doesn't seem like she confides a lot in him. So (laughs) she might not have told him all of her feelings about that, but he can clearly pick up on the vibes that like, this isn't, 
I don't I don't think that's true that Shiv is actually going to respect this. Yeah, he is more in tune to everyone's emotions here than anyone else's, I would say. The like power balance really turns on a dime because Tom he has been around for a while observing and he's he's not an idiot. He calls Kendall out and you know Kendall has no real response to to what Tom says it's just a pathetic attempt at blackmail and then he takes he takes some pictures of him and then tom really has like this mic drop line well you're here you know courting me at denny's the other side is like choosing the next president of the united states so (laughs) good luck and good night (laughs) it was so pathetic like what are you gonna do with that tom is going to jail they the other side needs tom they're gonna send him to jail there, there's nothing worse they can do to him or would do to him if they knew he met with Kendall one time. Yeah, he's not, like, teaming up with Kendall, so it's like, okay, nice blackmail, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom goes back to the hotel, and on his way up to Logan's room, he does this very sad walk that felt very reminiscent of the walks we have seen from Kendall and just fully cemented that he's the main character of this episode. He, yeah, he got a main character sad hallway walk. Yeah. I love this for him. <laughs> he deserves it. <laughs> he really does. It was great. Uh, God, Matthew, he's he's a really good actor. Oh, I wanted to say one more uh, one more thing before we move on from this. And this is this might sound like a weird, you know, comparison. But you know how I think that Jeremy Strong gets praised a lot and like rightly so for his performance but i think sometimes at the expense of brian cox who i would argue because they're like their scenes together are jeremy's best work in almost every case i think that is when he does his best work is when he's opposite of uh, brian cox so i think that he is really doing a lot of like work of like you know providing that foundation that jeremy strong is able to bounce off of the the reason i'm bringing this up is because i feel like in this scene Matthew McFadden was like the Jeremy Strong and Jeremy Strong was the Brian Cox. Oh, I just felt like he was kind yes, of providing yes, this that. more like <laughs> solid base for Matthew to like really shine because I think he really stole the scene. But I also think that Jeremy Strong was really like, you know, giving him a lot of good stuff to work off of. Yes, I think that's a really good note. And I think it's definitely a different style of acting, I would say, to have a quieter performance and yeah. be more supporting the other person. So I love Jeremy's multi-talented. I also, one more thing I want to point out about this scene was Kendall is the reason that Tom is going to jail, right? Because if Kendall had done what his dad told him to, right. then Kendall they would have accepted, the one they accepted the one head, there wouldn't be a DOJ investigation, and instead, Kendall's, you know, little stunt is falling apart, he's not going to be able to kill his dad, and Tom is going to jail anyway. They should just, like, still send Kendall to jail. <laughs> Just be like, can you can you just go arrest him, <laughs> that guy over there? <laughs> Honestly, I just feel so bad for Tom, and I think I think Kendall might might benefit from some structured time in jail. <laughs> some structured time away from being able to get power, but also still socializing with people. Yeah, like to be very frank, I am like it might be good for him at this point. <laughs> it's good to pay. <laughs> it's good to pay for the boy. Yeah, it's good to pay for the boy. It's time for Candy Baby. Ugh. Hot. Ugh. My Candy Baby for this week was also Tom. Oh, nice! This is my first time that my number one boy and Candy Baby have been the same, and I was not expecting it to be Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that is out of left field. Tell me more about Tom. <laughs> well, I loved the button-down and sweater look that he was rocking in his late night meal with Greg, but the scene that really caught my eye was, as we just discussed, the scene between Tom and Kendall when they're at the diner and Kendall was trying very hard to compliment him, uh, say anything to get fucked on a first date, won't you? (laughs) And Tom was being very humble. He was like ducking his head a little and laughing and it was just very bashful and I found it cute. I must also say that I do find his depression voice where he's just kind of talking very lowly it, it's sexy right yeah we can say that i 100 percent agree like i i have never found tom attractive until this episode <laughs> like something i don't know what it was but something clicked and i was all of a sudden i was like you know what shiv 
I get it. Yeah, I think it's because in this episode, he is the main character. Mr. Darcy. Whereas in other episodes, he was a side character. So through other people's point of view, we couldn't see how hot he was. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And also just how loyal he was to Shiv here, even though he doesn't really have a reason for it. But he's, I found that very sexy. My candy baby is Shiv. So we really went for the power couple here. <laughs> yep, just... Picking up the married couple who may or may not still be in an open relationship. Yeah, maybe I can snag both of them. So Shiv is always very attractive. I mean, true. we were going to be very objective. She probably would have been Candy Baby almost every episode. But I made a bargain with myself that I would wait until I saw the dress in this season. And I didn't know what the dress would be, but I knew I would know it when I saw it, you know? So yes, this gray long sleeve fitted dress that she wore, she looked really, really good. It was working for her. That scene when Tom, um, after his sad like main character walk when he returned to the room and he and he looked at Shiv. I will put this shot up while I while I'm talking about about this. So that shot, yeah, that was when I knew she she is the candy baby for this week. And she did end the episode in a much weaker place than I would have hoped. But up until that point, she was actually fighting for something, which really endeared her to me. We love characters who actually care about things and are comfortable expressing that. It's a really attractive quality. You're so right. (laughs) You're so right. Passion and interests. Yeah. Good traits. Sort of the, I think climactic scene in a lot of ways is between Roman and Mencken. I would say maybe the Tom Kendall scene was like the emotional climax, but this is like plot wise the the most important scene of the episode. Yeah, it was, I think there's just a lot to unpack in this scene. Like there's all of these, you know, dog whistles that I think just escalate to just being like a regular whistle. (laughs) The line where he said 40 new guys show up in the back of a truck playing their boombox. You kind of see the way that Roman's eyebrows kind of raised when he said boombox. Very obvious dog whistle there. And I think it was just really well-written dialogue. I was a little nervous about them tackling politics in like a comedy series. You can have more irony and like absurdity, but in a drama series, it has to feel a little more real and like grounded. And I think that can be really hard to get the right balance. And I, I don't think this episode ever felt preachy or over the top. I think it just felt really real in a way that was sort of sickening. Yeah, I think that when a lot of shows tackle politics, it can end up feeling very on the nose and trying too hard to reference things directly. But they just do things in such a specific and like research way on the show that it really works well. And I think the scene worked because of the way they kind of backed into it. You know, it started with Rowan being like, so fascists are kind of cool, but not really, right? Then they just kind of very slowly delved into just spouting fascist ideology very explicitly. Yeah, just like total great replacement theory, like very fascist talking points couched in some, you know, language that I think shows that People always think that they're doing the right thing, which I think is what it was really nailed here, is I think he wasn't this cartoonishly evil version of a fascist. Like, he was presenting his ideas in the way that he thought would be the most, you know, sympathetic, which is what people do. People aren't going around being like, yes, I'm a racist. People say things like, oh, well, people just trust people who look like them. That's just science. Like, the lines that he said, I think, were very well written because you can see the way that this kind of gets through to people when it's presented in a certain way. I think this is something that Secession really excels at, is presenting these characters who may have maybe morally corrupt, but they don't, you know, put a hat on them saying this is the bad guy. Like, they present them like normal people because it is normal people who are racist and end up doing these things. Exactly. I think that's like the whole point of Succession is showing like the people that are making our world like this and ruining our world are just like regular people who you can sort of relate to on on a certain level. And I think that just makes it kind of worse in a way because it's like you no longer have this like clear like enemy. It's just like, I don't know, this is something about this show makes me feel kind of hopeless, but in a way that I enjoy. It's horrifying. It's the difference between like, you know, a kid's movie where they have a villain who's like their skin is like green and they're not someone you would expect to see on the street. And I think a few lines felt like direct sort of references to people or 
news outlets like the bone broth and dick pills line really felt like an info wars uh shot and i think um the idea of having this sort of like what did roman say like a a deep state conspiracy hour on like ATN, really leaning into that kind of content and getting away from this more traditional conservative viewpoint to something that's more right wing populist. It felt kind of like what Tucker Carlson has really been doing lately. Like that, that was kind of the idea that I got was that like, that's kind of who he could be. Maybe like, maybe you could say that's more of like a raven head where he like comes from more um you know traditional background and has just sort of been like morphing in that direction there there is actually a profitable place for that on regular broadcast news to provide that kind of content that's coming from the internet conspiracy theory boards and just like putting it on the news and people eat it up i mean they do <laughs> it's terrible but roman like from from a profit perspective he was right like he had a good business plan it's just terrible <laughs> morally it's just terrible that he was the one actually answering his dad's question of who they should back Tib was coming at it from a moral standpoint instead of a profit standpoint and I think she was wrong, particularly about Salgado. I don't think, I'm doubtful whether he would have even made it past the primaries, let alone been elected president. I think Roman really did have his finger on the pulse here, unfortunately. Yeah, that's the takeaway here, is that, like, unfortunately, Roman is, is right. <laughs> Roman is right, and he has always been very right-leaning with Chip and Kendall, you know, they spout progressive ideology, and it's debatable how much of that is genuine. Um, but I think they do at least see people outside the family as having some rights. Whereas Roman is just outright saying racist shit all the time. So the shift, I think, made sense. You could totally debate, like, oh, you know, how much of it does he mean? Or is it just jokes and, like, irony? But I think that's exactly the problem, is, like, that's how a lot of this, like, starts with like like online you know radicalization especially is it starts with irony and memes and you know hitler jokes and then it just escalates from there until like now you are of a fascist congratulations <laughs> just a little pop up on your screen congratulations, congratulations you, you made it so it really feels like a very true um you know depiction of that where it's like yes if you if you want to defend roman you can be like i don't know how much he actually believes it but it's like that's not even the point is he's he is um working towards this like outcome and if he doesn't believe in it does that actually matter he's okay with it i think that's bad enough so far in this season roman has not really had a plot line yeah he's just kind of been hanging off other people's plot lines and i feel like this episode made it clear to me why that is. They were waiting to get past the shareholder vote so they could introduce this political storyline that I think he is going to be really prominent in. And looking back, I can see how they built this up. Like, they've been really emphasizing Roman and Shiv's relationship this season. Yeah. They were in solidarity while being on Logan's side. Like, Roman was kind of backing her up uh, when they went to visit Kendall's. Then, as the season went on, we started to see that crumble and then turn against each other. And then with this episode, with Roman going all the way over into teaming up with a fascist, he is in direct opposition to Shiv, who has always emphasized, you know, trying to be the most progressive one here. The two of them have not been in that direct of competition because usually it's one of them versus Kendall and they can kind of support the other one. But now that he's kind of out of the picture, they have had a lot more conflict with each other which is really interesting and kind of shows like there's no way to really win in this family because Logan will just continually pit his children against each other. Their relationship started falling apart when Logan started pitting them against each other and bringing everyone into room and saying, okay, what do you think? Real quick, I wanted to sidebar. Can we quickly discuss Roman's sexuality? Because I know a lot of people picked up on the <laughs> flirty vibes with him and Mankin. A lot of people did. I have always read... Roman is being bisexual, even though it's not explicitly canonical. Karen Culkin has said that at the beginning of developing that character, there was a thought that he would be bisexual. And he said, and I, I believe this is in the official HBO podcast for season two, he said that they decided not to go in that direction because it felt too like simple and that there needed to be like more to unpack with Roman. And if he was just bisexual, that would be like too easy, like, you know, slap a label on it. And <laughs> I have some issues with that because I don't think there would be anything 
simple or easy to process about Roman being the the son of an extremely homophobic man being bisexual. I don't think there's anything about that that would be easy for him to process. But that's all sort of not in the show directly. So I still think that Roman is bisexual. And I think this scene, as well as Logan calling him the F slur earlier in the season, I'm like, I wonder if they're bringing that plot back in a little bit. I wouldn't mind it. Succession is a show where I always feel very attuned to some subtext, but it's not something I really expect them to actually bring to text at any point. It would be nice if they did, especially as you point out, like, Logan is violently homophobic, and even in a healthier situation than that, like being bisexual and in the public eye to that degree would be a huge deal. Working for like a conservative media empire, he's yeah. never going to be out and proud by. I, I read him as being very repressed and probably just having all kinds of, you know, sexual dysfunctions that don't really even allow him to have relationships like that anyway. But if he wants to flirt with a fascist in a bathroom, I, I guess good for him. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the vibe I got from that podcast was that this was something they were considering as like an answer to Roman's kind of weirdness about sex in the first season. And my response to that is, why can't we have both? Like, I think it's definitely true that Roman has some hangups about sex, maybe related to something in his past, and he can be bi. He can also be bi. It turns out a lot of bi people have issues. I don't know if you've, have you heard that? Uh, I, I don't know. As a bi person, I don't have any issues, actually. I've never had an issue in my life. Yeah, I, uh, maybe some other bi people, not in this, yeah, not on me, this Zoom call. Not, not us. No, we've never had issues. Maybe if, if there is a bisexual person out there who does have issues, this would be nice for them to get it some It would be some good representation for, for bi people who have issues, which are not them, us. Not us. No. There is like some speculation about what is going on between Logan and Carrie, which sort of began a few like episodes ago when he had her listen to like the phone call with the president and there's been a vibe between them. At first I was very ready to believe in the previous episodes that it was just kind of a, a flirtation. Um, but after this episode, I am convinced that they're fucking and that Logan has a pattern of cheating. And I think regarding the affair with Rhea, my read is that Marsha was very bothered by the publicness of this. Uh, Logan making a joke about having multiple wives. That is not the kind of stuff she cares about her reputation. No, that was She's very a very insulting. dignified woman. I don't know why I feel like I want to push back on that, but I actually don't think that Logan and Carrie are having a sexual relationship. And I don't know why I think that. Maybe I just don't like to think about it. Because, you know, she's so much younger that it it is obviously a little bit uncomfortable. Rhea was closer in age, so it was like, sure, whatever. But I don't know, there is something about Carrie being his direct, you know, subordinate, his personal assistant, and also so much younger. Like, is she Shiv's age? Ugh, yikes. It's possible, but I also think that he could be getting the same thing out of this relationship if they're just sort of flirting with each other and he enjoys having an attractive young woman around to like, you know, touch his arm and show memes to. Like, I think that could still be very gratifying to him. And we haven't seen that Logan was as directly um, involved in like the sexual harassment that went on at the company, His, which is, you know, his claim. So it's like, you know, how much do we believe him? Because he was always like, oh, the rest of them were like a pack of dogs and I was always the well-behaved one. I don't know how much we take him at his word. You know, a lot of the thing with Logan is like, we'll probably never know for sure. Yeah, this isn't something I expect him to ever say explicitly. I don't agree with you, but I do support you Okay. in holding to your personal belief. Just the fucky eyes at the end of the episode convinced me. So the ending scene, um, family's taking a photo with Mencken and Shiv's asked to join. And it, it really seemed like she was going to say no and hold her ground. And I was hoping for that for her. But in a really perfect conclusion for her, she can't stick to her principles. She instead just makes this weak little um, compromise of, okay, I'll be in the photo, but not next to him. It was so sad. I've had a lot of moments in this series with Kendall where I'm like, please don't do it. Don't give in to your dad. And this was my moment for that with Shiz. Yes, it was she, so sad. 
she did give in to her dad because she is not the Cordelia in this story. And I'm impressed with myself that it took me six episodes to bring up King Lear. (laughs) (laughs) It was a rough, like, ending for her. I think it was perfect for, like, where she needs to be and to illustrate the ways that she will always put, like, her family and her ambition above her actual principles, which are, I think in this case, deeply held. But she can kind of put that aside for a moment for this. And it does seem like this is something that might come back to haunt her, I think. Oh, yeah. To have a photo with this guy is definitely an, an incriminating thing. And like she wouldn't even let Willa be in the family <laughs> photo at her own wedding. Although I think she eventually caved on that. But um, this is way worse than that. I feel like it's easy because Shiv speaks out again against their dad the most to kind of interpret her as like going out against her dad. But it really is all talk with her and she never actually does this in a public forum. The most she's done is refuse to do like a nice little interview talking about him being great. She always caves in the end. Let's close out with buy or sell. Sell seems cool. I am buying Roman. Much like offering an ATN show to a fascist, this is not a moral choice as much as a business one. Roman has been on the rise in his father's eyes for a few episodes now, mostly by putting himself in opposition to Shiv. This episode exemplified the ways in which Roman is really built for this moment and might have a more sophisticated understanding of people and culture and their dark sides than his siblings do. And this is something that Logan respects. It's what has made him so much money over the years. I am selling Connor. (laughs) He got some good play in this episode, but in the end, Greg scraped up some principles only to say that Connor should never be president. That does not bode well for him. He can't even sway Greg. I think Logan's praise was mostly a thought experiment and he wasn't that serious about it. And it seems like Willa is beginning to be less supportive of his political aspirations. He hasn't made any impressive moves this season, and I don't think that'll change much by the end. It's a really sad day when Greg is speaking out in front of Logan against you. Like, Greg is the person who is, like, always wants to go along with what other people seem to think the right thing to do in a situation is. Yes, you should never lose Greg. That's embarrassing. (laughs) For this week, I am selling Waystar. Nice! Get me out of this company! It has been a rough couple of months as a shareholder at Waystar. You know, there's an ongoing DOJ investigation, there was an almost buyout from other people who, to be frank, I was going to vote for them. A settlement came at the very last minute, which does not look great to me. And the final straw for me was that Several family members, all of them high-ranking members within the company, were photographed with Jared Menke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not good. <laughs> no, did you hear his chief of staff broke a kid's jaw at a rally? I did hear that. And for my buy, I am buying Lisa. She got fired in this episode, and it appears Kendall is going to try to do some kind of smear campaign against her but I don't anticipate this going well for him since it seems like public opinion of him at this point is pretty low, I would say. I think it's for the best for her that she got out. She was probably going to lose that case anyway. And also our buy and sell concept is kind of ambiguous, so maybe in a way I am actually hiring her as my lawyer. I mean, her client list recently had an opening and she seems like a kick-ass lawyer. Yeah, good for you. (laughs) Thank you. Well, thank you for listening. Next week is the ever so anticipated too much birthday, Kendall's 40th birthday party. This is my most anticipated episode, like apart from the finale. I'm so excited for this episode. So we'll see you next week for that. In the meantime, let us know in the comments, what was your favorite line? Who was your number one boy? What was the best burn in your opinion? Who's your candy baby, etc. Tell us. Please shout us out in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Yep, and we'll see you next week for the event of the season. (laughs) The Notorious Ken.
We now have confirmation that the Kennedys exist in the same universe as as Succession, which is interesting to me because I have always wondered if Chappaquiddick happened in the Succession yes. universe. Because if it did, I can't see a world where like the car crash came out and nobody made a Chappaquiddick reference. It just feels unoriginal for Kendall have, to have committed a manslaughter in that fashion and then cried to his dad about it like that if Chappaquiddick happened in this universe, just kind of sad of him. Yeah, like, do a more original rich boy train wreck thing. (laughs) Yeah. But I would love if somebody made a tweet that was like, oh, so your woke king, Kendall Roy, did a Chappaquiddick? 